Welcome to episode 91 of Live with the Maverick. My name is Dominic Lee, founder of Maverick Actuary. We are a content community. Our mission is to maximize the impact and value of quant professionals on a global scale. The goal of this series is to educate our community on the most relevant themes in actuarial science, risk management, and analytics. The theme of today's discussion is small business consulting. And we are very excited to have with us our guest for today's episode, S.P. Mead. S.P. is principal at Actuarial Factor. So welcome, S.P. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you for inviting me to, to be part of, of this community. And hopefully I can maybe give two cents, you know, to, to someone, you know. My pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. And we just love to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, well, um, I am an actuary. Uh, next year, actually, I will be, um, be, I will have been an actuary for almost for 30 years. So I'm quite excited about it. Uh, my first half of, of that journey, uh, I work with assurance here in Miami for 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 um, seventeen years, and um, and then I, I went basically I started as an actuarial intern the one summer, and I continued working with them throughout the years, and I became a director. Uh, and then after, but in, when I work on assurance, I primarily focus in the U.S. market. So ever stayed in the United States. But then when, um, like the last two years in assurance, then I started my get my feet wet with Latin America. So I was quite excited about that. And then after assurance, I went uh, to ACE, now CHOP, and I was their chief actuary for all of Latin America. And after, um, and that in that um, role, I had teams of actuaries throughout Latin America that reported to me. And I was in charge of all lines of business, um, property and casualty, personal business insurance, uh, accident and health. Um, so basically everything. And after that role, 10 years ago, I started Actuarial Factor. Uh, also here in Miami, basically I haven't moved. I love Miami so much that I haven't <laughs> moved. Uh, so I, I started my own consulting 10 years ago. And I I think it's definitely, I'm grateful to my two first employers because they gave me the foundations, you know, to be an actuary and the experience because I won't be where I am today without their their help, you know, and support. So so definitely I'm, I'm grateful through through that journey. Excellent. Now, one of the things I'm excited about with this episode is you're currently the principal at Actuarial Factor, as you mentioned, and that's a boutique consulting firm. And I know certainly in the actuarial community, especially when I was early in career, we know a lot about the big four, you know, the really big companies um, that have tens of thousands of employees. But certainly, I'm, again, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but that certainly I think a lot of folks can say this is that we don't get as much insight into those the the smaller firms so you know just curious to know so you're you you kind of um you got to the chief actuary role at your last company which i imagine must have been a very fulfilling role a rewarding role you had lots of responsibility now what is what inspired you to say i'm going to take a step back and start my own consulting firm um, Dominic, you're right. I mean, when I was um, chief actuary, it was very challenging. Um, I worked like crazy. Um, it was, yes, and I traveled a lot. Uh, we did a few, when I was there, that we did a, a couple of acquisitions. So um, I was part of the due diligence teams and it was just um, very challenging, but I thought it was amazing because I, I never had the experience of going through the due diligence. And I just thought it was an amazing experience. Obviously I had to work until like 10 at nine, you know, but but it was um, 
amazing. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, right? And stuff like um, but but it was definitely an experience that I I I loved it. Um, and the team of people were very talented of actors that I work with. So I was, I mean, basically I was, um, it was the best experience that I can, that I can say, you know, and the uh, top executive managers, like all the underwriters, I mean, they're just incredibly smart. So I, I loved it. Let's put it that way. Um, what started what started the idea of um, of starting my own consulting practice was actually when I interviewed them, which they actually called me, so I didn't really was looking for. Uh, and when they interviewed me, they actually asked me, um, "What will I do if I didn't get their job?" You know, and then I'm like, I'm thinking, it like you're calling me. I'm not, you know, I was not looking for for a new job. But in any case, um, at that moment, I, you know, I just paused and I thought. And then I said, I will start my own consulting practice, you know. So sure enough, after I left um, ACE, I um, I started my own consulting practice because I felt like, okay, I have been doing this. Like I've been building teams. I have been doing all of that. But <laughs> what I didn't know <laughs> is that what is your own money? It is so much different than using somebody else's money. In other words, if I need it staff, I'm like, okay, I need somebody. And of course, I just ask HR, yeah. please bring me some <laughs> candidates, right? And even like everything was um, given to me, essentially, right? And, and and somebody paid for it, right? Like, you just have to convince that we need it. Yeah. A new resource, and, and that was accepted, you know? And But now it's like, no, it's... It's not coming from somebody else. It's coming from me. So that is that is definitely a challenge. <laughs> so so I, I always think that it's important as you are working with your employers to think like a business owner, to think about is what if it's your money? <laughs> you know, will you still do that? You know? Yeah. So, you know, you, you talked about the challenge of personnel, which I think anyone can relate to. Yeah, you know, what were some of the other challenges that you? I imagine you faced several challenges as you're transitioning from being a corporate employee to a business owner. What were some of those other challenges? Well, the one thing that I thought that was uh, good at, <laughs> very good at, was uh, an actor, right? So I'm like, I know my thing. You know, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm passionate about. It. I'm like the rest. I don't know anything about it, but I figure I'll figure it out, right? I, it would have been nice if I had worked for a consulting firm right before, so, so that I would have an idea of what I'm getting myself into. Um, but I, I didn't have that experience. Um, I didn't know where to get clients. So I think that was the most challenging thing is like how to get clients, um, how to market the business, uh, how how much to charge. <laughs> um, yes, it was basically the even even more than that is like if you step back it's like how do I talk to clients you know and and ask them for business I'm like I I didn't think myself as a salesperson however uh, I haven't been always been told that we do sell every day on your daily work when you deliver the results to your to your boss <laughs> um you're selling your output you know your your service you know so, so I think we do sell, even though we don't realize that we do sell on a daily basis, the ideas, right. And our opinions. And I think, I think when I, when I think back is, I, I think that was the much more challenging followed by, or at the same time at the same level is the financial side, you know, when when I read all a few books on the statistics on how many small business fail the first year, second year, third year, I'm like, he's like, what did I get myself into it? <laughs> it was really scary because if it's like they say, if you don't fail in year one, you fail in number two or three, it's like basically the chances of failure were so large. And the number one reason for them was money, running out of money. So I think to me, that was like kind of the most critical thing. Um, 
and and the way I think I I was a help, help right <laughs> I was glad that in my previous employer uh, job they even though they're huge they're very cost conscious you know budgeting making sure that everything is in the budget and and yes it's very <laughs> extremely cost conscious so so I applied that to my job you know and I, I develop a budget for both the personal side as well as the business side. And thinking that maybe I don't I didn't know how many years it will be, but based on what I had read about it, it said that it takes 24 months of burden an elephant. So I'm like, okay, so that means at least two years, you know, where I will start seeing some rewards but at the meantime I need to basically do it so so it was a lot of um sacrifices you know to to be able to make in your daily life so basically no vacations no nothing nothing extravagant right and even just going out to restaurants I had to keep it to a very minimum because I didn't know really how long it was going to be to get the clients so so I think yes I think that many people want to start their own business uh and I I think it would be important to consider basically if you think you're going to need x amount of money multiply it by 3 or 5 you know because <laughs> it's is it does take a lot of um, resources and even though you I did end up doing a lot of the work myself on simple things that I didn't know like creating a website and things like that but that saved money so anyway and, and I thought I was really good with money <laughs> with budgeting yeah. so, and I still went over budget you know it's interesting what you said I think there's definitely something irrational to being an entrepreneur, because when I think of the risk aversion within the actuarial profession, I think most actuaries would have read what you read and have come to a different conclusion and said, okay, well, I'm definitely keeping my job, but I'm glad that, you know, you were able to see the glass, whether it's half full or a quarter full or whatever it was. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, anyway, I'm, I was crazy, I think, um, because it is, you're correct. I am definitely risk averse. I, I'm definitely like, I'm like, I'm very safe. I like to play safe. I don't like to like overdo anything. And I still consider myself risk averse, but it, I think I just felt like, you know, it's like, this is what I want to do, you know? <laughs> I think it was more my um, drive to what I wanted. Um, more so than than I think my risk averse is, is still there. <laughs> I cannot deny it. I always think about risk. Yeah, one thing I can certainly relate to with some of the stuff I've been doing recently is is figuring out how much to charge. And I know that's something that a lot of people can, is a challenge. Like, did you ever think when you were just starting, like, no, you know, I can't, I can't charge this much and then it ends up being maybe less than you should have charged or anything like that. Do you have, have any aha moments there? Like my, it was interesting. My first client, like I, I just thought, I'm like, okay, I, I thought what are the amount that I wanted? And then I just gave like a 15% discount. Right. And, and we did a lot of work. I had to travel and present to, to upper management a few times. And when when we were done, he wanted to pay me more, mm. and and I was like, like I knew that I was like, oh my god, this is it, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. My client <laughs> wants to pay me more. I'm 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 for it, you know. Um, he was really happy with the work that we did. Um, and also, uh, I had to go and travel and communicate it. So they did they, they pay for all my travel expenses. Um, so that was very, I was very happy with that. I think I didn't quite know how much the charge, but I had an idea because we did in my previous companies, we did hire, um, consulting actuaries, mm -hmm. but mainly for, for some, for reserving. So I wasn't quite a hundred percent sure how much to charge. And and another client, early client, they told me this is how much these other two consulting companies that are large are charging me for, mm -hmm. for the service. And I'm like, 
He's like, can you match it? I'm like, fine, we'll match it. So I was like, what is the amount? Yeah. <laughs> because I have no, I have no idea, right? Um, but I think as I figure it out, like then I figure out how much I will want to charge. I think in my case, in our case, like for a company, like I don't, I do value our work. Um, so I don't want to be like the cheapest one. I, I think our quality of the work is fixed for itself. So I do think that we need to charge what is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Now you talked about reading. When we talk about filling those entrepreneurial knowledge gaps, you talked about reading. And I think in a previous conversation, you mentioned doing courses. Is there anything else that, or well, I guess I, I should, curious, like what books did you read? At, like which, any book in particular, any courses in particular, and anything else that you did to help you close that knowledge gap and help to, you know, move you from kind of corporate to, to entrepreneur? Um, I read almost every book that you can think <laughs> of, but before reading a book, um, I actually got my second designation. I became a, uh, a fellow of the Society of Actuaries um, right before. And that was the, because I was responsible in my previous employer uh, with life and health as well, besides property and casualty. So I felt the need to, to do it, to be able to market myself better. Um, but in addition to that, like I read every book that you can think of. Um, I read it. I, I tried to make sure that I got myself um, knowledgeable about where I was getting myself into. So I read, I bought a, several books. And one of them was Bird and an Elephant. And it basically says like the different um sections of building your business how the importance of it like for example um marketing the the budgeting the you know each of the aspects of it and that's where it says basically when you first open a business you don't you should not expect that if you have a store even if it's physical that customers will run in to come and trying to buy your your products it, that it takes time for for the people to get to know you and, and all of that and it's the same thing in the service world it takes time for people to to believe on on, on your service and I do recall uh, at the very beginning when I started um, meeting people they will say some of the people will not give you new business because in the first two years because they want to see whether you succeed or not so I was very grateful that we did have a few clients sign up in the first two years so not everybody had that mentality but but in reality it does because not many people not everybody know you you know and and um but besides reading the books, I also attended several courses in SCORE. And also I got a mentor for, for marketing from them. And I also uh, joined Toastmasters hmm. and for three years. And I um, attended basically a couple of times a week to, so that I could improve my my speaking my public speaking abilities yes because i think that i thought that was really important um when i have to speak to to prospective clients yeah those masters is great I, I used to do that as well so no you know now that we have a, a good understanding of your trajectory and motivations let's dig deeper on your company and let's talk about you know the clients and the markets that you serve so why do clients come to you and how would you describe the clients you serve? Um, our clients are insurance companies, reinsurance companies, captive insurance companies, self-insured entities. Um, so we do have a, a variety of them. And why do they come to us? That's a great question. I think most of our clients come with um, people that I know from my previous my previous employers. They um, they they're working in different um, companies, and because they have known the work that I have done in the past, they come to us because of that knowledge. 
And if it's not through personal knowledge, is somebody from there referring us to somebody to somebody else? So referrals, I think, is um, what we get most of the business, and then obviously we we get the remaining as well. But but I think I I don't I know there is a lot of big four, and they have a lot of knowledge. But I think most besides the big four, most um, consulting companies are focused in a specific um, country, you know. So if you're in the United States, you work in the U.S. I think what's unique with us is that we are international and, and we have the experience for, for the, to do an international business, but also domestic. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned you talked about the benefits, of course, of being multilingual. Yes, that definitely helped. Although <laughs> I, I always say that, like I, I don't speak English, I don't speak Spanish. I'm like I don't know what I speak <laughs> because it, it is um, it, some of the terms that we use, the terminology is very specific, right? So if I say Avinar, I say Avinar, you know, <laughs> even yeah. if it's in Spanish, you know. So I I have to stop and think how to say it in in, in Spanish, you know. Uh, so it doesn't come easy. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a great opportunity here to dig a bit deeper on the, the type of clients you serve. I think, you know, to be able to con kind of compare and contrast that with, with some of the, like the bigger four, the big four companies. So I know when we spoke the first time, you mentioned that, I think you mentioned that like three key situations uh, in terms of the clients that you serve. Um, as far as what type of work or, or meaning, yeah, meaning, meaning, I think you said that for instance, the first situation would be when the com when they don't have an internal, the company doesn't have an internal uh, actuary. Yeah. Yes. I think we have different types of clients. Some of our clients, they have their own internal actuaries and, and they, um, handle, um, in some cases they just handle the pricing, but they always want to get a, uh, a third party an independent party to perform the reserving opinions. So they hire us to do that. Uh, and in other cases is the, those actors may not have, the internal actors may not have experience or credentials for the jurisdiction where they need to be. And, and in those cases, again, they come to us just so because we have that knowledge. Um, like I mentioned is most, most uh, actuaries are, do provide services in a specific country. So once you go outside that country, they cannot sign. Yeah. And you gave a really good example. You talked about, for instance, a company from Latin America that wants to write business in Florida. And you mentioned that, of course, the actuaries in Latin America would not be able to be qualified to sign. Correct. Correct. Yes, we have instances like we have actuaries in, in Argentina that they have their internal actuaries there and the company may be in Puerto Rico and um, they cannot sign. So then they hire us to to provide the services say, in Puerto Rico. And we have another one that is in uh, Argentina, the, the main company, and they're looking to do business in Texas. So they will hire us to do business. Granted, the internal actors maybe can do some of the day-to-day -day work, right? But as far as um, working with the Department of Insurance, um, it, it would be a, a company like like us. And then you 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 provide another example which I thought was interesting too. You mentioned a U like for instance a U.S. company who wants to write business in like Mexico. Uh, for instance, they may and, and they may need to develop a product. But at the same time, the U.S. actuary may not be able to submit that product within Mexico. I thought that was an interesting example as well. That is true because, it, um, as you know from our, our standards, is we do need to comply with the insurance laws of the state of domicile. So if the company is domiciled in Mexico, we have to comply with the requirements there. Yeah. And a few others that you mentioned, which I thought were interesting, you talked about, you know, low capacity, no expertise in a particular line of business as well. So I think those. those yes, two. we have some clients who have uh, excellent actuaries and it's just mainly that they don't have enough resources 
So they, they do come to us to help them with specific um, price for specific projects that they may have that come up from time to time. And uh, in some cases, the companies may just hire different uh, consulting firms. So we have, we sign a large company this week and they hire large companies <laughs> for reserving and they hire us for some of their, their work as well. So, so I feel like um, because we have the experience of more international that I, I cannot say that we can compete with the big four because we, we don't, right? Um, but I don't consider myself any less, you know, our quality of the work. Sure. And then there's, it sounds like there's a situation where the company may just not have an actuary at all. Is that, is that common? Yes, yes. A lot of the companies that are um, medium, medium size, they don't have their own um, internal actuaries because of different reasons. And we, we basically do all the work for them. Mm -hmm. Is it mainly because of size and resource or focus? Sometimes on... they don't have them available. They don't have actuaries. The lab, basically, they don't have actuaries. They just don't have it available in the market. Okay, yes. that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um... Well, actually, I had a follow up. Uh, this is interesting. We talked about the stock companies who want that second opinion. Do you do you run into situations where the internal and external views are divergent? And if so, like, how do you kind of reconcile that? You know, because they when they want to, someone want to validate the reserves, for instance. Um, that's a great question. We haven't quite come across um that um issue, um, but I guess the, it, it could happen, right? Um, if, but if it does were to happen, I think it's more of a matter of talking with the um, with the actuaries that are developing the the um, the reserves and see where their perspective is, and make sure that we find out exactly what they were thinking because there may be something that we could be overlooking too, you know. So so I think it's more the dialogue just to make sure that we have full understanding. And based on that, then we can see, okay, maybe they move a little bit or maybe we move a little bit, but we do need to understand. Great, great. So, so thanks for that articulation there. So now that we have a better understanding of the clients and the markets you serve, let's dig a bit a little bit deeper on the services themselves. So, you know, what services do you provide at Actuarial Factor? Um. We provide um, basically all of the services from an actuarial perspective. We provide pricing, we provide reserving, we provide uh, peer reviews. Um, we also provide uh, mergers and acquisitions um, when they need it or expert testimonies and so on and so forth. So so I think our, our goal is to be able to provide um, all services from that we that we know, right? And we also do uh, capital calculations, capital requirement calculations for few jurisdictions as well. And um, the the lines of business are all of them. Uh, we cover all the property and casualty just because that's where I grew up, right? Uh, and we cover every state in the United States. We cover also uh, Latin America. Um, we we know business. We do business in all all of the countries, and with the exception of of um, Venezuela, and we also do business in the Caribbean. And some of our um, I was gonna say the we do in Latin America and Puerto Rico. We do also do besides property and casualty. We also cover life and health. Um, be, because of my background on, on that. One thing that you mentioned, which I thought was interesting, was you said, as, as most people who practice in the U.S. would know, is that the annual statements are line of business specific. So you'd be, you know, you do a different one for the various lines of business. But you mentioned that, I think, in Latin America. And I'm not quite sure if they call it annual statement, but whatever the equivalent would be. I think you mentioned that the lines of business are... Combined? Is that, would that be? Yes, yes. It's, it's like in um, in most of the Latin Americas, like Mexico, for example, they have all lines together. 
and also Panama. Like it's a girl with every country in the Latin America. And so so when when they hire us, they just don't tell us, oh, you just handle the PNC, you know? Although some of our clients were like, they used to have one actually for property and casualty, another actually for life and health. And then when we came in, they gave both to us. So to them, it was easier, you know, to, to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it is very unusual because it's better to say that they do separate it completely. And in the United States, we don't do life and health because just because I, I think there is a lot of business for PNC that we don't have the need for, for expanding it. Um, I don't know if in the future we will do it. Potentially we will, because I would like to be able to offer all, all lines. Well, that sounds interesting though. I must keep you busy and keep you you know, intrigued with all these different lines of business and, and, and the geography. So that sounds, that sounds really interesting. Um, so, you know, you mentioned specifically, you, you mentioned that your company does business in the U S Latin America and the Caribbean. So let's talk a bit about regional dynamics. You know, what, what specific regional dynamics have you observed in practice when we talk about, you know, in the environment, the nature of risk products, et cetera, you know, is there anything you can speak to within those three key areas? <laughs> Oh my God. Um, <laughs> well, it is different. You know, each, like I said, is I always think of risk, right? So when I'm, when I, for example, if I am in um, Mexico, I think earthquake, you know, and in the coastal, the, the uh, hurricanes as well. So there's definitely regionally there's risk. And, uh, and if I'm in Florida, hurricanes, right. And flooding. So, so there is the risk continues to be different based on the region right and and it is different um but as far as i feel like lines of business right um like for example uh casualty in the u.s it's um their loss ratio is much higher because people maybe because they are um I, I do not know <laughs> the word, but, but basically there is more losses because people probably file more lawsuits, right? Yeah. Whereas in Latin American countries uh, like Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, they don't quite file that many claims. So the loss ratio tends to be lower for, for casualty. So so there is a... Um, it, it definitely a difference by line of business. So I can't quite say every single line at this moment, right? But but I can tell you that for casualty, there are significant differences among what you see in Latin America versus what you see in the United States. So, so it, it is important to know the business. And if somebody, for example, from the U.S. is looking to expand in, in Latin America, I think it's important to you, they can start with the U.S. if they don't have anything, but also to adjust it to the local market there, you know. Um, so any product can be tweaked a little bit so that it gets adjusted for the needs of that market. So so that's so important because we can't just, it, the same way that they cannot do it from, from Latin America to, to the United States, it cannot be done also the other way around. It needs to be reviewed very carefully, the, the um, policy forms, the deductibles, the limits, the, the exclusions, everything needs to be adjusted to the local needs, you know. That's a great point. And I was, I was actually going to ask about that is that what are some of the most common differences you see across products or sorry, between products across geographies? So you mentioned policy forms, deductibles, limits, exclusions, anything else in terms of the, the key differences between the products? Well, it, it, there's a lot of differences because like if you're talking about life, you know, the mortality tables are way different in Mexico, say, versus United States. It, they're different. The mortality rate in, in Latin America, it's higher, tends to be higher than in the U.S. So when we compare mortality tables, so it depends on the product, right? Um, on on the um, property side, it, it tends to be, I feel like maybe that's the one item that is consistent is there is there are hurricanes there, uh, the same way that it, they do here in the United States. However, the impact may be different because the values of the 
houses there may be lower than in the United States. So uh, for every product, I can tell you a million differences. So, so I think we'll be here all day. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh no, it's good to know. No. And you, so you talked a little bit about mortality tables, like what region specific challenges do you encounter in practice? I imagine perhaps maybe one geography versus the next presents challenges for you in terms of the work that you're doing and, you know, in terms of how you approach the work and what you have to, to deal with. Um... So currency, I think is one thing we mentioned in our previous conversation, like Corey talked about currency risk and, few other things yes i mean currency risk is definitely an issue and it's more so in like a country like argentina but even some of the other countries do have some currency risk so it depends um i think one way to go about it is to do the reserving in u.s dollars you know to the extent that it's possible um but um i'm going i'm thinking back to what you mentioned about like a challenge I think for us, like our biggest challenge sometimes, I don't know if it's geography or that, but it's more um, when when our clients have, like, say, a new um, opportunity and they they basically there is a short window of the opportunity. So if they have like two weeks or a week to they're like, OK, to our team is like, here it is, the new opportunity He's all the data. Uh, tell us do we participate yes or no you know and it's it's mainly the timing you know if, if they give us one or two weeks to review a whole book of business with many lines and, and we have such a small window trying to analyze it and, and in a very short period of time and be able to give them the go ahead yes or no you know with with that book of business when we're dealing with millions and millions of dollars <laughs> so that is basically very um challenging rewarding but also um definitely difficult you know it's not an easy task to be able to do it but i think that to me is the most challenging thing is to be able to make a decision in short, such a short period of time when you're dealing with millions of dollars. And how do you feel about uh, something I have to ask about is data? Cause I know that that can, I mean, that even in the U S that can be a challenge. So would you say it's just more or less the same challenges or <laughs> anything interesting there? <laughs> it was not in the United States. We, we didn't have that good data. <laughs> we were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I think it's the same old thing. I think in the United States, obviously, we're now, we now have the big data and everybody's like has a lot, implemented a lot of changes and automations and we supposedly are more advanced in that regard. In Latin America, unfortunately, it's not as advanced. They're still uh, more, um, not all the fields are being captured, you know, so there's more challenges, let's put it that way. Yeah. Totally understandable. So, um, and one one more thing too, actually, so we, we didn't talk about cyber. Cyber is something that's been emerging. And, you know, I think you might have mentioned that there's challenges with cyber penetration, even though, of course, everyone's susceptible and vulnerable to that. Is that something that you're seeing that conversation happening, you know, in terms of the, con the, the work that you're doing? Yes, we definitely have uh, our... Many of our clients um, increase the retentions for cyber. It is definitely a risk. It's a global risk. It is increasing globally, not just uh, a particular country. So we are seeing our companies buying higher, higher layers of, of coverage for, for that particular risk. And I think now with the, from one side, it is, Wonderful, I guess. Uh, I I do think that artificial intelligence is a, a a great tool, you know, to be able for us to use it as actuaries potentially and and in basically make it better. I feel like the same way, like the computer, you know, mm -hmm. we use it as a tool and and makes our jobs easier in the sense that we can perform better, you know. So I think artificial intelligence is 
I think it's a good <laughs> a good uh, thing that it has emerged, a good tool. Although there is a lot of people against it, and some people in favor it, and and some think that they are like it's evil, you know. I don't think it's evil like anything obviously he has the potential right if they don't control it right but but it does have it does give you additional tools to explore but because of that new technology I think from our from the perspective of actors we should be able to hopefully use it on our job and help us perform better you know and but because we're now you're going to be using more of that there will be increases in the cyber uh, security issues because now if they can use our voices or faces or expressions how can we tell you know the real dominant dominantly you know from <laughs> the fake one like i don't know you know uh i think it would be a challenge you know they, they do need to put some controls in place for that, but but I I can see the cyber issue to be even more more of an issue as a result. Yeah, I heard someone say once, and I, we won't go too far down this rabbit hole. But I heard someone say once that in the future, the default would be to assume that when you see someone on a video that is fake, and then you have to prove that it's real. Which I thought that was interesting. <laughs> well, now Dominic, I'm gonna say, is Dominic is that real you? <laughs> <laughs> I promise, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know congratulations again you mentioned earlier in the conversation that you're the 10-year anniversary i think it was recently for actuarial factor or whether you're there or you're close it will you know, be so... in, in in october yes thank oh, you okay okay that's great so as you know as you reflect on your journey so far and you know, what have been the keys to success because evidently you were not one of those businesses that disappeared after the first year or two so you know what <laughs> What are some of the things that have worked for you so far? I think uh, having a great team, my team is um, very, very smart and they're very passionate, you know, being an actuary and they work really, really hard, you know, they're very responsible. And I think our clients see that, you know, like I don't have to tell our clients that our, our, that our team is really smart and that they care because they see it on the day-to-day -day work that they do. So I, I am very thankful to my staff and I am obviously grateful to our customers, uh, our clients, because they, they believe on us from day one. A lot of the clients sign up in the first year and, and I am just grateful to them, but they, they continue working with us on a yearly basis. And I, I just, I don't know if there is a key to success, Dominic. I think I believe that in working hard every day, it does, you know, you will see the rewards in the long run. If you don't work hard every day, you're not going to get any rewards, you know. But if you do, on a daily basis and your team and you work and you're passionate and you love what you do, you will see um, the results, you know, whether they're monetarily or not, you know. Great. So in summary, have a great team, provide excellent service, have practice, discipline and focus and love what you do. Yes, I definitely love what you do because they're not, they're the, what will be the fun for, you know? Yeah, so can't think of a better note to end on. You know, I really enjoyed this conversation. And, you know, my hope is that we can certainly inspire some actuaries in the future to to perhaps start their own business and to explore international opportunities as well. Yes, I, I hope so. I hope that um, that somebody hopefully decides to, to pursue it. And if they do want to call me, they can reach out to me and I'll be happy to help them. So was, would LinkedIn be the best place to contact you or by email? What, what's the best way to contact LinkedIn you? or email, either okay. way is fine. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time, SP. And um, this was enjoyable and let's, let's definitely keep in touch. Thank you, Dominic. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye.